The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. There it is, a tail walking steelhead trout. That's what the anglers like to see, the fight, the battle, the splash. Steelheading is an exciting activity. The steelheader in the streams right now all around the state. We're going to talk about that, take you steelhead fishing on the Muskegon River in just a minute. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in this state of Michigan Mark Martin pushing his riverboat in the water during the daylight? That's right, in the spring, our championship night walleye guide switches over to Steelhead, one of his favorite rivers, the Muskegon. Downstream from Croton Dam, the Steelhead trout jam the river bottom at times, searching out places to spawn. Although the banks are high and steep, this river in most stretches is relatively shallow. Most boats you see are small aluminum boats with large chain anchors off the bow. The rocky bottom isn't far down, only a few feet, and Mark runs with his motor tilted up off the public boat launch, no point in damaging a propeller. You can see these river boats have snub noses. They're flat bottoms so they can run in shallow water and over the gravel bars. The extension handle on the outboard is extremely useful in river fishing because in order to spot the fish on the beds, you really have to stand up. And standing while motoring takes a longer handle. Now, I know some of you are going to say this is terribly unsafe, and I shouldn't be putting this on television. Especially, I shouldn't show Mark crawling for a higher view. And nobody appears to be wearing life jackets. Okay, okay, this is true. But this is fishing the way most experienced anglers do it. Number one, you have to be high to see the fish on the beds, and the water is often shallow. If you fall over, shallow water isn't far away, and you drift into it. This is fishing. This is steelheading. The flat bottom boats are extremely stable, and this is the way you hunt for steelhead. Now, I wholeheartedly endorse wearing life jackets if you can't swim, if the water's rough or windy, if you're concerned about keeping your balance. But on a day like this, the conditions are ideal. So now let's talk about catching steelhead. Noodle rods are popular. Those are the long rods, 12, 14 feet, that can handle extremely light monofilament line. You can hook a lot of fish that way, but the problem is you can count on losing most of them. So you hook more, land less. But a lot of anglers enjoy it. Here's a couple of fellows fishing faster water. Now they have the same problem, fish breaking the line. Now that's a common occurrence, fishing steelhead in the rivers with any tackle. Now here's a boat that doesn't let many fish get away. That's a DNR shocking boat, the one that collects fish for the eggs, takes them to the hatchery so we can propagate more fabulous fishing in Michigan. They were shocking the Muskegon on Monday looking for walleye, not steelhead. The electrodes in the water send out an electric field for a few feet on each side. So electricity comes from a generator on the boat that's fired up when they want to start collecting fish. The generator sends some pretty good jolts to the electrodes in the form of DC current, which stun the fish. Very rarely is a fish killed in this process, and when it is, it's usually a fish that was on its last leg anyway. Normal fish, normal healthy fish, are only momentarily disoriented and somewhat immobilized. Now, it isn't long before a few fish start showing up beneath the boat. Now, what happens if a DNR fisheries technician falls overboard by accident? Nothing because both of them have to be standing on pads which allow the current to pass. If one of them isn't standing there, the juice will be cut off. So that's a safeguard for the employees. Now we have a good batch of fish. Most of them are white suckers. Oh, missed a walleye right there. That was a big one too. Wasn't totally immobilized, but they'll get the next one. Okay, 
here comes another one aboard. Nice sized walleye that'll be spawned out and put back in the river. They're held in a tank in the boat until they can get to the biological work. But so much for walleyes. Mark Martin and Bob Garner are fishing steelhead. Now you can see a steelhead against the gravel bottom just above the end of the fishing line. It's that dark shadow in the water. Now you can see it move. As the bait is worked by it, hoping to entice a strike, the steelhead feels a bit harassed and drops back in the current to a deeper hole. Spawn is a favorite bait, steelhead eggs wrapped in a mesh fabric known as a spawn bag, or using a fly that imitates a small minnow will also work. And to keep the bait down in the current, some anglers drop a few split shot off a short line on a three-way swivel, while others use a slip swivel running on a main line for the weight. Steelhead rods, well, they need to be fairly substantial, seven to nine feet is average. And if you cast the spawn or fly upstream, let the current bounce it down past the steelhead, try to get it right in front of its nose. Now here the steelhead is below the line, just to the right. We're looking at it through a polarizing filter on the camera. Anglers almost always wear polarized sunglasses to cut the glare. Once again, we bug the fish. You can see it as it crosses the lighter gravel there back and forth, it's dropping back into a deeper hole. But every now and then a big steely grabs your bait. Many think not grabbing it to eat, but as a reaction to clear it away from its spawning bed. And when it finds it's hooked, it gets even madder. This particular fish was on Mark's line about a half hour, put up a good battle. Whoa! <laughs> well, we're not exactly sure what happened. It could have been that during the battle, the line got wrapped around the fish, the hook pulled loose and rehooked in the body, or there's the outside chance that the steelhead accidentally hooked itself as it swatted at the bait. But whatever happened, at the time it was netted, it was clearly a foul hooked fish, and according to the letter of the law, it's not legal. So despite the fact that the body hooking could have been accidental by both angler and the fish. The law treats it as an intentional snag, says foul ball, the fish must go back. Seems a shame, doesn't it? Well, it's the only steelhead that Mark and Bob landed that day, but back it goes, and hopefully someone else will catch it. The big joy in steelheading for most anglers is that spectacular aerial battle. The jump, the fight, that's what causes anglers to flip their lids over steelhead fishing in Michigan outdoors. I wish we could have brought you lots of big steelhead we could keep. The problem has been the weather. That cold blast that came through here last week, it was disastrous on the fishing. It's an early season with this warm weather. It's got to be great. We got to have some big trophy fish this weekend for our trophy book. It's time for those perch to be fat with eggs, adding extra weight and pushing them over the one and three quarter pound master angler minimum. Dennis Jernigan from Flint caught one last spring from Lake Huron off Iosco County, still fishing a crawler. The suckers have begun running already. Time for some trophies to be caught like this 24 inch, four and a half pound white sucker that Tim Wizerkowski from Alpena caught still fishing a wiggler in Bell Bay up in Presqueo County. Here's a fish that qualified last year when I had an eight inch minimum on pumpkin seed sunfish for a Stroh's fishing award. Madeline Lighthizer from Acosta caught it from Pretty Lake last year. Madeline never fished until two years ago, caught her limit her first time out, but this year, Madeline, your pumpkin seeds have to be 10 inches to qualify. No question about qualifying here. Jim Gidry Jr. from Vernon took this 45 inch, 24 pound muskie from Thornapple Lake last summer. Probably a great story behind it, but Jim didn't come to our fishing awards banquet to tell his musky tale, like this walleye story we heard about. Robert Faka from Royal Oak has a 29 incher. He was still fishing through the ice, a Swedish pimple, Lake Erie. Yes, we had caught uh, three walleyes. My dad had just gotten a seven and a half pounder. I thought it was staring out the window and looking at this walleye saying what a huge fish that was. And, I felt this come on and 
as he came up, my dad tried to gaff it and tried again, tried again, and finally the line caught around the gaff, and I said, just pull it. And he got it in the stomach, and I knelt on it, and it went out the door. Just like, just like recovering a fumble, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Swedish fumble. It's a nice walleye that just met the Stroh's fishing award minimum of 28 inches. At our hunting awards banquet, Kim Singley from Erie has this big buck on display, a 17-pointer taken from Hillsdale County on November 12th. A great buck and a great photo that makes Kim Singley our Michigan Outdoors Bow Hunter of the Week. We reported a few weeks ago that if you bought your Michigan fishing license and got this fishing guide, there were some glaring errors in it that, that were fairly serious. Now we find, I just bought my sportsman license, I find my deer back tag is white. I mean, a big no-no in the outdoors. Bob Garner has comments. There's a major problem this year with the deer license back tags, and the problem is they're white. Now, every deer hunter knows if there's a color to be avoided during the firearms deer season, it's white. Most of us who hunt deer wouldn't even think of carrying a white handkerchief into the deer woods. And nobody wants to be mistaken for the tail of a white-tailed deer, rightfully so. The problem occurred when the DNR Administrative Division tried to put the back tag and the kill tag together. They wanted a tough, tear-resistant paper, so they chose the same paper they've been using for kill tags for several years. Now, that paper is only available in white. Nobody saw a problem, so the licenses were printed. It wasn't until the new wildlife chief, Carl Hosford, saw a license that anyone noticed the obvious problem. Hosford raised the roof and demanded the Administrative Division fix it. Hosford could see that hunters might be quick to blame his wildlife division for an error they hadn't even been a part of. I've been assured that a solution will be forthcoming to either reprint the deer licenses or to stain them with some color. Licenses already sold are another problem, but the department says they'll fix that too so that no one will have to hunt with a white back tag. Now, whatever's the solution the DNR chooses, it will be costly. Other questions remain about the back tag. Why is it so small? And because it includes a kill tag, what happens if you lose it? Hunters and fishermen who pay the bills deserve to have a DNR that understands their needs. And the DNR has fumbled the ball lately on several key and different issues. And until their head coach, Director Gordon Geyer, gets his team working together again, sportsmen will continue to be the losers. Bob, has the DNR been making more goof-ups lately, or, or is that, are we just looking at it closer? I, I, I don't know. It seems, it seems as though they are. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, maybe we've just been looking at them too close, but we're finding, finding a few things that really need to be straightened out. Talking about goofy situations, Bob, we got a letter somebody wrote in about Charles something Kennedy of Flint, yeah. He said, I saw this article in the Detroit News. He says, can a moose really breed a cow and produce offspring? Well, here's the article you saw, Charlie. A, a, an odd couple, a, a moose that they said was having a romantic relationship with a cow? <laughs> I don't think so. You take a look at the offspring, really, of moose. They have calves. So they're named, you know, cow moose and so on, but I think that this was just sort of an errant bull moose. There's no way that they can reproduce. It's a different species altogether. So I don't even think it was romance. I think people read that into that. I think it's just some wacky bull that has a screw loose somewhere. A quirk of nature. A quirk of nature, that's right. Nothing's going to come of it, I guarantee you. Now let's see if you can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. Advancements in medical science have reduced the percentage of firearms accidents that result in death. How does today's fatality rate compare with the statistics in 1940? In 1940, half of all firearm accidents resulted in death. Today, less than 10% are fatal due to advancements in the availability and the quality of emergency health care. Steelhead fishing, a rigorous activity in the spring and fall when it's cool. Small boats aren't a place you very often find sportsmen in wheelchairs going after steelhead trout. But Monday on the Muskegon River, Bob Garner ran into Mick Johnson from Edmore. Mick has been unable to walk for many years. He contracted a, a, a disease with a long name, a disease similar to spinal meningitis when he was six years old. And while it cramped his style, it didn't cramp his love for the outdoors. Mick hunts deer, he fishes, he spends a month each spring fishing steelhead. You know, you wonder, how does a guy who can't walk manage to do all of this? Well, that's a question that a lot of you are probably asking. 
must have some problems getting out. Oh, not really. Just got some good fishing partners. Some good fishing partners? Makes a difference. Otherwise, won't be here at all. Good fishing partners. Mick Johnson said he wouldn't be in the outdoors if it weren't for the help of his good friends. That's what it takes, not just for long-term disabilities either. Anybody who has had a physical difficulty outdoors either gets help from friends or stops hunting and fishing altogether. Now, where do you find good friends? Well, last weekend you could find them at our Outdoors Club Fishing Workshop, sort of a warm-up to the outdoor fair. The exhibitors and the fishing experts who conducted the seminars and well, a lot of the people who showed up were top-notch folks, helping each other with ideas, sharing experiences, not making big secrets about how they catch fish, but really trying to help everyone else find success in the fishing world. And you know, that's what being a sportsman really means, being fair, being helpful. Not having to win and be better, but enjoying the outdoors with other people. Now, sure, we enjoy the solitude of the outdoors, but we also like to share it with people we like. Now, consider people who can't walk anymore, or maybe they can't walk for six months or a year. Or what if you break a leg or have some problem that affects your walking? Now, wheels aren't the total answer. You also need friends. That's a big reason for Outdoors Forever. As Roger McCarville explained at our first organizational meeting for Outdoors Forever chapters last Saturday, people are what Outdoors Forever is all about. Roger often says that memory loss is a big problem for people with disabilities. Now, they don't lose their memories. The problem is their friends do. They forget them. But there's no reason to forget your buddies outdoors. Hunting and fishing are activities. Now, I say this over and over again. They're not sports. They're not competitive. We don't have sidelines and benches. I mean, everybody can participate. Nobody sits on the bench outdoors. Catherine Mulhaupt passed out materials, fact sheets, information that has never been compiled before on how to overcome all kinds of physical difficulties outdoors. And people shared products, tried things they'd never seen before that enabled them to hunt and fish. Now, could this fellow here be you someday, a broken arm, unable to fish for the season? Well, sure it could. And your only hunting and fishing insurance that's worth two hoots is knowledge on how to solve physical problems and your good friends. We're our own best hunting and fishing insurance, folks, and we can help each other enjoy the outdoors forever. Is that a deal? It's called Salmon Broccoli Cheese break, Bake, and I think it's the closest thing to a perfect recipe I've ever seen. <laughs> Patricia Ware from Hastings sent it in, and it had to be a very close contender as a finalist in our recipe contest. It was. This is amazing stuff. It, like it says, it has broccoli, mm -hmm. salmon, Something cheese. Something you don't normally find in a casserole like that. No, it has all kinds. It has uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, onions, onions <laughs> white pepper, eggs, <laughs> and the bisquick. And, and broccoli, like I say, you don't normally find a vegetable in a fish dish. I don't think there's too many people that would guess how it's going to taste. No, it's, absolutely mm. not. If you're going to boil your fish, you want to pre-cook it. If you have, happen to have some left over that's already cooked, you could use that. Even if it was fried or... That's right. Yep, take the breading off. And you're going to mix that. There it is bubbling great. You're going to mix it with your broccoli. You want to cut it up into little pieces. Yeah, so you take all the bones out. Yes, yep. Gonna saute your onions in the meantime, and you want those just a little bit more in saute. You want them lightly browned, actually. You're gonna mix the fish in with the broccoli, minus the bones. And stir that up. You know, yep. it's amazing how much salmon like this tastes like tuna. It does. Tuna and this fish. recipe, it just it, it just mild it right out to almost nothing. You're gonna put that in the bottom of your casserole dish, and you do want to grease it, and put shredded cheese in here. And this is cheddar, so it's kind of strong. A you could bit. use Swiss if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. I don't no, know. This no, cheddar is no. mighty good. <laughs> mighty good. Going to add your onions right on top of this with your butter. And everything goes in one dish. That's what's nice about this. You know, that looks like the end of the recipe right there. Yep, it would be good just like that. Put it in the oven. Now, this is weird. We're going to go ahead and make a crust here. No, and, well. Well, it's not actually a crust because it, it is pourable. It could be a crust. Bisquick with one and a quarter cups of milk, three eggs. How fast can you do those, Kev? Very fast. <laughs> mm. Got three eggs in there. And white pepper. That's for the... The coloration, That's so it right. isn't all speckled. Yep, and generally in white dishes you'll use a white pepper. And there's that Mix white it all pepper. up good. I'm just going to pour this over the top. Now it's beginning to appear like a souffle. Yep, and that's just about what it tastes like when it gets all done here. Going to put this in the oven, and not for very long. It only cooks about 25, 30 minutes. When it comes out then? And then you're going to add tomato slices, mm. 
and cheese on top. And they come at the very last stage. There they are. In fact, look at this. this you know, this has so many attributes to it. <clears throat> it stays hot. So I think you could cook it the day before and it'd still be warm the next day. Here, Bob, here's another. You oh, can, you can taste all of the ingredients in it. Separately. You can taste the broccoli it, by it, itself. It sticks together so you don't waste anything. That's right. It's, it's like, you know, the spinach souffles. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you, buy, you, could, you probably do this recipe with spinach, but this is a complete meal mm -hmm. all within itself. Great and it's delicious. Nightmare. Just delicious. You can even taste the egg if you try to. <laughs> you can taste all the different ingredients. It's beautiful. I think this is outstanding. And it's super when you eat the tomato with oh, it. It yeah, gives it another it's flavor all together. All together, yep. An outstanding job, Patricia Ware. It is a great recipe, folks. You ought to try it with some kind of cooked fish. Maybe you can catch one this weekend. But at least get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. But whatever happened, at the time it was netted, it was clearly a foul hooked fish. And according to the letter of the law, it's not legal. So despite the fact that the body hooking could have been accidental by both angler and the fish, the law treats it as an intentional snag, says foul ball, the fish must go back. Seems a shame, doesn't it? Well, it's the only steelhead that Mark and Bob landed that day, but back it goes, and hopefully someone else will catch it. The big joy in steelheading for most anglers is that spectacular aerial battle. The jump, the fight. That's what causes anglers to flip their lids over steelhead fishing in Michigan outdoors.